at the connections counter. All right, if you would, let's stand, greet those around you, and prepare your hearts for worship. Seen together. Some may trust in horses, some may trust in chariots. Oh, but I, I will trust in the name of the Lord. Some trust in their riches, some may trust in all. trust in the name of the Lord. Sing together. There is wandering, working power, Holy Spirit power, great redeeming power, power in the name, resurrection power, bondage breaking power, power in the name of Jesus. sing together. Sing this thing. From the darkness I called your name Into darkness your mercy came You called me out Lifted me up How great is your love you bore my weakness, you took my shame, buried my burdens in fields of grace. You called me out, lifted me up, how great is your love. From the heights of heaven, you stepped down to earth. In perfection, gave your life for us, and we are amazed. Yes, we stand in awe, for we have been changed by the power of the cross. How great, how great, how great is your love! How great, how great, how great. How great, how great is your love. 
this Sunday morning. It's good to come together and sing praise unto the Lord. Let's gather around his word this morning. We're in Psalm 62. This is a psalm of David, started in verse 5. He says this, Yes, my soul, find rest in God. My hope comes from him. Truly, he is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress and will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. He is my mighty rock my refuge trust in him at all times you people pour out your hearts to him for god is our refuge this is the word of the lord that word refuge is used many times in that passage of scripture defining that lord is actually our refuge we can also translate that shelter it's part of his character that we can run into he is our shelter and we find safety. We find shelter from what? Sometimes it's problems that we're facing. Sometimes it's uncertainties. Sometimes it's provision. Sometimes in David's case, it was fleeing an enemy. And he says, God, you are my shelter. 
and he runs into that shelter and does what? He waits for the Lord. And you know that is a sign of a mature Christian, those that know how to wait on God. Because in the waiting, oftentimes we get restless and we try to uh, insert ourselves in the process and it just makes it worse. And we run to the Lord and we pray and we wait for him to move. You realize when we pray, he hears us and he acts. And sometimes we can see it, sometimes we can't. But we are loved by God. He hears us when we pray and he acts on our behalf. And what is required of us to wait on him? Where do we wait? We wait in the shelter of his love, of his power, and of his authority. Let's focus on this this morning. Let's bow our heads. Let's meditate upon his word. Let's consider this word refuge, for God is our refuge. Father, as we come before you this morning, as we read your word, we are encouraged knowing that we can run to you and that you will be our refuge. It's a part of who you are. It's a part of your faithfulness. Lord, and teach us what it is to wait on you, to help us in our time of need, to give us direction, wisdom, knowledge, understanding. Lord, we know that you act on our behalf, and we're so very grateful. Teach us what it is, Lord, to pray your will. Teach us what it is to see things from your eyes. Teach us, Lord, what it is to wait patiently for the Lord. Lord, as we gather, we sing praises unto you, for it's our delight to worship you. As we draw near to you, Lord, please draw near to us. Reveal yourself to us, Lord, through your word, that our souls might find relief. We praise you this morning, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. Let's continue to sing together.
Let's pray together. Father, we desire to walk in the commands of Christ as we abide in you. And Lord, that as we follow the ways of Jesus, you are teaching us how to abide. Lord, we want to live in the sphere, in the territory of your kingdom. And Lord, that your will would be done on earth just as it is in heaven. And Lord, we would experience you to the utmost, to the fullest. And Lord, I pray you change us, you make us more like Christ. Lord, that our relationship with you would grow closer and closer. And Lord, I just pray for any of the distractions to be removed. And Lord, that we would see you more clearly. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you would, open up your Bibles uh, to the book of 1 Samuel. And we will be studying 1 Samuel chapter 24. It's 1 Samuel chapter 24. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the chair in front of you. And uh, since you don't have a Bible, please take that one. And that way you can have it to, to bring back as we study the Word together. And it's our gift to you. Just take it. It's a great translation. You will love it. As you're turning to 1 Samuel chapter 24, I want to read something. It may sound like science fiction. It may sound like something that can't possibly be true. But let me, let me let you read it. I want, I want you to listen to this as it's a true reality for your life. And it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with Him, with every spiritual blessing in the heavens, in Christ. For He chose you in Him before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. And in Him we have love, and in Him we have been redeemed, and in Him, in this heavenly realm, where the mysteries of Christ are, the mysteries of His will, we have the forgiveness of sins, and in Him we receive His inheritance. Think of that. A kingdom that is invisible, the kingdom of God, and that He sits upon a throne that is more real than the person sitting next to you, and He says, you have an inheritance. Sounds almost fictional, but it's true. And so this heavenly realm and where we are blessed and this heavenly realm and where we abide, we just sang about it, abiding in Him. It's this whole concept of this parallel universe. One is very temporary, that is actually the test, and the other is the reality of God's presence, and that is where we live. And as a believer, if, you're, if you've chosen to follow Christ, then you've chosen to follow with this worldview, with this idea in mind, that we don't live for this world, we live for the next. That what God is doing up in heaven, He desires to do down here on earth. That's why Jesus said, your kingdom come on earth just as it is in heaven. And Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and every principality, power, and ruler of darkness, that is the maybe the disobedient entities that live in the spiritual realm that invade the physical realm, they are to bow at the name of Jesus. So here you and I are in the crosshairs. The enemy wants you to not be here. The enemy does not want you in the Word. The enemy doesn't want you to think of eternal things. The enemy wants you to go along with his agenda and his worldview. And so there literally is a spiritual celestial battle that's going on with your soul in between. That's just the truth. You say, Brother Mac, that sounds like a movie I saw the other day. Well, um, fiction mimics reality often. And you always see good and evil. You always see something authoritative and something not. But here's the truth. It's just laid out before us. And you and I have a choice to follow this. So when we come on the 21st Sunday night to do a prayer summit, it's in the context of this what we just talked about, that this is for real and that the way in which we walk in obedience is definitely in prayer. Prayer is the playground and the venue of warfare. It just is. And when we together with all of our spiritual muscle, in other words, all the people of God coming together to pray in this fashion, then things change. We'll be praying. Some of you have been to these prayer summits you don't have to pray out loud. You, don't, you can just sit and watch if you'd like, and you're going to love it, and I invite you to do that. But you will watch others who willingly, whoever want to, participate in prayer, and we begin to see God do some incredible things. Let me put it this way. Um, you probably came to faith with a great expectation of the supernatural. Am I wrong? You probably did. You probably thought, you know what? Said something like, God, if you're real, 
Lynn, I want you to prove something to me or I want you to do this or do that. And I know you've always, every one of us have had those kinds of thoughts. But if you don't make room for that to happen, then you'll probably never see it. And so a prayer summit is making room for God to move in our midst and to do great and mighty things. So, I don't know. You may have better things to do like watch Cuckoo Fran and Ollie and not show up, but that's, that's up to you. That was a joke, by the way. I thought it was funnier than you did, but anyway, there we go. So, 1 Samuel chapter 24. <clears throat> Let's just read the text together. But before we read, I want to say this. Why are we reading in the Old Testament? Um, well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says that we read these, the things of the Old Testament because it reminds us of what God can do, and these people become an example for us. So you will see an example in the story of someone who's doing things wrong and someone who's doing things right. So we have a contrasting example, and you and I have a choice to choose who we, want to be, who we want to be like. But secondly, as we discuss the kings that are, that are here, kings and kingdoms, as we discuss these kings and kingdoms, and we see how Paul does what Paul, or how Saul is doing what Saul is doing, and we see how David is doing what David is doing, it forces you and causes you and me to want a better king and to long for the true king of kings when we see this. So that's why we study it. Also, I want you to see where this setting is. It's, it's an incredible setting. And it's a very fearful setting. It's a very intense, passionate setting where lives are on the line. And it reminds us to inquire where our personal securities are, what we rely upon, what we long for. And then we're going to look at a temptation, and we're going to see that avoiding the temptation that takes you far away from God, and we're going to look at that temptation we're going to avoid running off the reservation and taking matters into our own hands. And we don't want to do that. We want to avoid that. And we want to avoid destinations that are outside the will and the blessing of God. And so as we fall into various valleys and darkness of the soul, there is a temptation that we all face. And we want to avoid that. And we want to be strong. And so let's, let's, with that in mind, let's look at this passage. When Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines... He was told, David is in the wilderness near En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 of Israel's choice men and went to look for David and his men in front uh, of the rocks of the wild goats. When Saul came to the sheep's pen along the road, a cave was there and he went in to relieve himself. In other words, nature called, he had to go. David and his men were staying in the back of the cave. So they said to him, look, this is the day the Lord told you about. I will hand your enemy over to you so you can do to him whatever you desire. Then David got up and he secretly, in other words, he walked to wherever Saul was and he secretly cut off the corner of his robe, which I'm sure he laid his robe down to do his business. Verse 5, afterwards, David's conscience bothered him. Let me read that again, chapter 5. I'm sorry, chapter 24, verse 5. Afterwards, David's conscience bothered him because he had cut off the corner of Saul's robe, and we're going to look at exactly what that meant. And he said to his men, I swore before the Lord I would never do such a thing to my Lord and the Lord's anointed. I will never lift a hand against him since he is the Lord's anointed. With these words, David persuaded his men, and he did not let them rise up against Saul. Then Saul left the cave, and he went on his way, and after that, David got out, and he went out of the cave, and he called to Saul, my Lord and my king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed to the ground in homage, and David said to Saul, why do you listen to the words of people who say, look, David intends to harm you? You can see with your own eyes that the Lord handed you over to me to this day. Someone advised me to kill you, but I took pity on you, and I said, I won't lift a hand against my Lord since he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, Look, and he held it up, I'm assuming. The corner of your robe is in my hand, for I cut it off, but I didn't kill you. Look and recognize that there is no evil or rebellion in me. I haven't sinned against you, even though you are hunting me down to take my life. What an incredible scene that you have. It's in a beautiful location uh, if you're going there for a day, but I would hate to live there permanently. It's in the backside of the Negev area to where it's very deserty, not a lot of water, but when water comes out, it's like a lush garden, like a Garden of Eden. 
And someday you've got to go with me to, the, to En Gedi, to where this took place. It is magnificent. We don't know where this exact cave is. In fact, it probably doesn't exist. Many, many earthquakes have taken place, and a sediment-type cave would pancake pretty quickly with the earthquakes that they've experienced over 3,000 years since then. But you can imagine what that's like. Saul had been out chasing the Philistines and going to battle. He had 3,000 young warriors with him to track down Saul. As soon as he finished with the Philistines, he said, now I'm back to track down David. Saul was trying to kill David. And so he went to this area looking for David. He heard he was in the area. He never expected him to be right there, though. I mean, this was a, a, it was a pathway. It was a thoroughfare to where herders, it was an easy path where herders could take their sheep, their goats, the ibex, or whatever, and they could just, but he never did he expect to be there. In fact, David didn't expect Saul to come show up because he was out chasing the Philistines in battle. So he thought he was safe. And so David and his men heard the clattering of the warriors. And his spy said, man, Saul is coming with his 3,000 men. And so they immediately tucked in the first cave they could find. And there they were. And of course, you know what happens. David, I'm sorry, Saul brings his warriors through. He sees the pass. He sees the cave. And then kings, even kings have to do what you have to do. And nature called. And he goes in that cave, as it says, to relieve himself. And when he does... David and his men start backing deeper in the cave and just saying, this is awesome. This is incredible. And his men said to him, in fact, his men quoted a prophecy. And his men told him, he said, look, this is the time. This is what is meant when it said that the Lord has delivered him into his hands. Look, this is the day the Lord told you about. I will hand your enemy over to you so you can do to him whatever you desire. And then David started on his way. So you see the setting. The setting is like the setting that you find yourself in many times. That life isn't going like you thought. In fact, can I ask you this question? How's life going for you? Was it like you thought? For some, it's like, man, I've seen great, great disappointments. Great different tragedies. I know there was a time in my life that it's called uh, who would have thought season. It's like so many things were happening and we would say to each other, man, who would have thought this was going to happen? And who would have thought it turned out like this? Who would have thought life was like this? And it is an incredibly insecure feeling to where the things that can be shaken were shook so that it could establish the things that could never be shaken. So what God does allow in your life and my life is to shake the things that can be shooken. Is that right? Shooken? I'll get emails later. No more. To shake the things that can be shaken, to establish the things that cannot be shaken. And you and I are in search for the things that cannot be shaken. I mean, we don't, we don't want to build families on sand. We don't want to build careers that are going to tumble. We all want security. The problem is insecurity prevails. Insecurity is that feeling that you don't know what's going to happen or you don't like what's happening and you want to change it and you want to change it now. And so you have two options in the midst of insecurity. You become aggressive or you can become very, very passive. You become to where you're attacking or to where you're the victim. It's where, in an in a, in a overstated sense, it goes from homicidal to suicidal. You don't like what's happened, so you're going to get aggressive and get rid of whatever's there, whatever's keeping you from being happy, or you're just going to become very, very passive and settle for a lower level of expectation. But it's your insecurities and my insecurities that drive us into positions and into settings that is full of temptation. You see, the Lord doesn't want that. The Lord has a different way. In fact, the Lord allows us to go through these things, and some of them are incredibly severe, just to teach us a simple lesson. Because when we consider the Lord's view of things and the worldview that we are to have, we are to realize that life is uh, very, very short. 62.5 years, I think it is, still. And if we were to draw a line and we were to go west as far as we can, right out there, you can go rest, west forever and ever and ever, right? You don't ever go east if you go west. And you have a line that's just going and going and wrapping the earth and you were to use that line and string it out straight, and that would be similar to eternity. And in relation to that, our 72 years takes up maybe a space the size of an eyelash. It's just so small. 
even the fake ones that are really thick. It's just so small, right? And that, I mean, let's just, let's just exaggerate it. Let's say it's the width of your pinky finger now. In relationship, that's very, very wide. But in reality, it's very, very small. Life, as Scripture says, is but a vapor. Just, it's gone that quick. And then in the midst of our life, we get tied up in what we see. We get tied up in, in our pulse. We get tied up in our images and all the social media. And that becomes all the world to us when in reality, it's going to be over in a flash. And we should be thinking about the things of eternity. And the things that really matter most. The things that cannot be shaken. Which are eternity. So in the process of trials and tribulations and disappointments and, and spouses that aren't acting like they should or, or bosses or employees and, and these things that are very tragic and very painful, health and diagnosis and all these things, and not to make little of them, they're huge issues. It makes you and me feel very, very insecure. And a very insecure person is a very dangerous person, at least for eternity, at least for making good choices. So let's walk through this for a second. So here David is. Think about it for a moment. David, as a very young boy, was anointed king by the prophet of God. Here he is. I mean, he's feeding sheep. His brothers are going on with bigger and better things. He's left. He's the last. He doesn't count. And all of a sudden, a prophet says, you're the man. You're a man after God's own heart. You are now king. And he's like, woohoo! <laughs> you know, he's king. And the next thing you know, he kills the giant, Goliath. And he becomes a national hero. And his face is plastered everywhere. And they begin to make songs about him. Saul killed his thousands. David killed his ten thousands. He's our man. And Saul got really, really mad. David at the time was <clears throat> at the White House. And the, the, the president or the king was a megalomaniac. And he got mad at David. And he threw a spear at him and started chasing him. And, and he took his wife away. Remember, he killed Goliath. He got to marry Michael who was Saul's daughter, and cha-ching, you marry the king's daughter, things are going pretty good for you. And so he's on this great acceleration and upwardly mo mobile, just busting through every single ceiling you possibly could for a little shepherd boy, and all of a sudden the king doesn't like you, takes away your wife, and chases you all over the country. That would be a valley going through, right? He's trying to kill you. And then all of a sudden you're hunkered down in a cave, and you're hiding in the back with your other warriors. And you've got the king, the one who's trying to kill you, in the most humble situation that you could ever imagine. And all your friends are saying, kill him. God said you could kill him. Kill him. But he completely avoided the temptation. And that is very, very important. And that's what he does. So the... Here's what you and I need to be very careful of in the midst of these temptations of our insecurity. When you are wanting to change life and you're wanting to change the circumstances, you and I need to be very, very careful of the voices we hear. It's really interesting that you can nowadays uh, tune in to the voices you want to hear. In fact, a guy by the name of Alan Greenspan, not, not the guy that, uh, that was the uh, economic guy, but he was another one. He wrote a book called The Agony of Deceit. And he talked about how uh, the more intelligent you are, the more likely it is that you will be deceived. Isn't that strange? That doesn't sound right, does it? But his case in point is this. He said, those that are intelligent have the ability to marshal all the facts they want or assuming facts to present a case to defend the direction they want to go in. And so what we really find out is we make decisions not based on evidence, we make decisions based upon the climate and the condition of our own heart. And here's what I'm saying. When trials and tribulations comes and life stinks for you or for me, this is the time to be careful to the voices that you are listening to. David was listening to his voices, his men. In fact, they quoted a prophecy, but the prophecy was wrong. It was either a prophecy that never existed or is a prophecy taken out of context. We see in the story of, of the prophets that were speaking to Jehoshaphat and Ahab in the book of Numbers, chapter 15, 38 and 39, it was very clear that uh, Michal was the prophet of God. And Michal was the one who was always the minor, minority opinion. In fact, the king says, I don't want to talk to him because he never goes along with my plan. 
He never goes along with what I want. And 400 prophets said, yes, go attack your enemy. And finally he asked for Michael's, and he says, no, you're going to die if you do that. And he says, you're always telling me I can't do what I want to do. So the question is, do you and I marshal, do we gather together the voices that tell us what we really want to hear? Or do we really want to move in the Lord's? Another thing to be careful about is be careful of the opportunities, particularly the opportunities in darkness. This was in the darkness of a cave. And it would have been out of the exposure of other men and women of God. And it just would have been among the voices he was hearing and himself. And he would have committed murder in order to get rid of his pain. So you've got to be very, very careful about the opportunities in darkness. And then he ends up approaching the king. And as the king probably did what you and I do, if we were going to, in his situation, we'd take our robe off, we'd throw it aside, get down to business. And while he was doing that, the guy sneaks over, David, and he cuts off the robe, the corner of his robe. And then as soon as he did that act, and it was just as sinful as killing him, it says that his conscience bothered him. Do you notice that? Verse 5. Afterwards, David's conscience bothered him. What a powerful advantage of having a good conscience. A good conscience is to be strong. A good conscience is something that bothers you when you're doing wrong. So a conscience is the faculty of the mind that's inborn or it's inbred or it's onboard inside. And it's a sense of light that helps you discern between right and wrong. It's your conscience. Everybody is born with a conscience. But one thing we know about this conscience is that it is damaged by the fall and because of sin. We all have a damaged conscience. And that's why it says in the Bible, sometimes it seems that there are things that are right to a man, but in the end there is death. So it can seem that we get all the voices around us and it feels right and we just want to be happy and we, we think God wants us to do whatever it takes to be happy, so we go for it and, it's be, and, and our conscience allows us to do it because our conscience can also be seared. Did you know that? In Timothy, it talks about having a seared conscience. You've been too close to the fire of sin and you stayed there too long. And that's when you and I, when we stay around sin so much and we participate in it, our conscience becomes weak and it's seared. It's similar to if somebody has a serious burn on their skin, they no longer can feel because the nerves have been damaged. So you and I can have a conscience that has been seared and we need to keep it strong. But also, a good conscience and a godly conscience always keeps its vows and that's what David is doing. David, his conscience bothered him so that he would stick to his plan, which is never raise a hand against God's anointed. He was still king. God had taken away the anointing, but he was still in the office of anointing. Do you see the difference? God had taken away his personal anointing, but he was still in the office of anointing. And David said, I, I said, I would never raise a hand against God's anointed at the time. And he wanted to keep his vow. And that's exactly what he did. Also, a good conscience can persuade others to walk in faith. And that's exactly what he did. You know, let me ask you this question. How strong is your conscience? I mean, I actually don't know the interplay between your conscience and the Holy Spirit. I know it's there. I don't know how to dissect it and break it up anatomically, the, the anatomy of it. I don't know how that works. I know that a good conscience that's focused on the Word of God becomes like the Spirit of God and that your conscience and the Spirit of God work in step. I know that happens. It happened here. God didn't want him to act like a fool. And yet it says, my conscience bothered me, so he moved. And so, do you have a strong, good, godly conscience? It's something you and I are to build. It's something you and I are to work on, and, and it works really good. It's, it's kind of like a circuit judge in your brain. It's kind of like uh, anybody use the, the, the maps on your phone, that GPS-type system? You ever do that? I was driving in Dallas the other day with my wife, and it led me on a road that I've never been on, and it definitely seemed to me the very wrong road, but the British lady talking to me said it's the right road. You know what I'm saying? She's acting with her accent. She sounds so smart, but I'm like, she don't know what she thinks she knows. Turned out she did know what she thinks she knows because she was the GPS, and I'm not. And I went ahead and took another turn. And you know what she said? 
recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. And I'm like, hey, Chris, when I do what I want to do and not what you want to do, how come you don't say recalculating, recalculating? I didn't say that out loud. It would not be a good thing. Oh, she's here. Sorry. I'm in trouble now. But that's what happens. You, you take a step off like David did, and all of a sudden that recalculating takes place. You're caught. You're exposed. You're insecure. And what do you do? Do you allow the conscience to recalculate you? Do you get back on your path? Do you get back to where you're going? Or do you just justify? No, I have a right to be happy. I can go anywhere I want. Doesn't work like that. Well, they told me I could do this. Doesn't work like that. Everybody else is doing it. Doesn't work like that. I mean, if we followed everybody else, we would all be in trouble, wouldn't we? It's a problem. It's a major problem. But then comes the confession. This is the hard part. There was the repentance. That's what he did. He told his guys, man, I never should have done this. <laughs> I shouldn't have laid a hands on God's anointed. And now he goes out to confront or to confess publicly to the king of what he just did. And so you know what happens. The king is done with his business, nature calls. So he finishes his work, he flushes, and he moves on out. That's what he does. By the way, that would be called a royal flush, by the way. <laughs> Been waiting 15 years to say that. You can't just come out and say it because it's not in context. But when I'm in context, I had to bring it up, right? 15 years been waiting on that. Got it in my notes. Don't forget to say. So there, just to you. So he moves on out. And it's time to publicly confess. Incredibly difficult. When you've been caught or you're feeling insecure and you want to just confess it, there's a, there's a big slap to your pride. In fact, David was putting his life in his own hands to make things right. That, I'm telling you, that is going to at the nth degree. That is how serious we need to take a good conscience and walking in the security of the Lord when everything else is insecure. That's what we're called to do. So in other words, we are to live out our convictions with boldness. This is what happens. He steps out of the cave. Saul gets back on his horse. The men are fixing to move out. And all of a sudden they hear this scream from this young, would-be future king. And he just shouts out. Can you imagine what happened at that moment? That somebody behind you calls out your name. And all the horses turn back around. And all the warriors are grabbing for their swords. And their, their legs are just tied against the flanks of the horses. And their muscles are tweaks. And their ears are back. And they're about to pounce and destroy David, at any moment, I'm telling you, David was putting his life in his own hands when he decided to come clean. I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that is bold. You want to be bold about something? Be bold about your actions of repentance. I mean, it's not popular. It will take place at the, at the risk of your reputation. It just will, whether it's just with a child, with a parent, with a spouse. There's something about a confession that just does something to the feeling of bringing more insecurity into your life. If I tell my boss I did this, he might fire me. If I tell my employees I've been acting very selfishly, they'll no longer respect me. If I confess this to my spouse or my kids, what will they think of me? Honestly, it's irrelevant what happens next. It's that you and I are to walk in boldness and to live out our convictions even when it's costly. And that's exactly what he does in this passage. It's a beautiful statement that he makes. So Saul left the cave and he went on his way. After that, verse 8, David got up and he went out of the cave and he called Saul, called to Saul, and here's what he said, my Lord and my King. That's just a true statement. It's putting him in the posture in which he belongs. And when Saul looked behind him, David bowed to the ground. Not only do you need boldness, but you must have humility. We talk, we talk about humility a lot because it's a major characteristic of bringing the presence of God in your life. And you need to live out your conviction of humility, of who the Lord is. In fact, humility is just an acknowledgement that in the midst of my insecurities, God is on his throne. And it's when we turn to the character of God 
and meditate upon who he is and what he does, it's easy to become very, very humble and very, very dependent. Remember the passage of Scripture Pastor Scott read earlier, Psalm 62, the Lord is my refuge, and blessed is everyone who takes refuge in him, and that your securities are in him and then no one else, and it feels very insecure, but that's why we need humility, but also let out, you need to live out your convictions by being different. If you, I tell you brothers and sisters, if you live according to the ways of the world, you, will, you must have a seared, defiled conscience to live out the ways of the world. You know that, right? Do you know that the prince and the power of the air, the enemy, is the one whom those who walk in, distant, in disobedience are following? Ephesians chapter 2. And you and I used to be exactly like that if you're a Christian now. In fact, it says that. It said you used to follow the prince and the power of the air in your disobedience. And it says that the world is like that. Jesus says there are two roads. One is very small and thin, and the other is wide and broad. Jesus goes on to say, the wide and broad way, most and many are those who go down that road, but the narrow road, few are those that find it. So you and I must be emphatic in our minds and our hearts that the broad road and the popular road and being with the in crowd is probably the wrong crowd and the wrong road. You've got to know that. You've got to know that all that is bombarded in your brain and my brain, in the arts and in the media, in the print, in the course of this world is following the broad road. You've got to know this. You've got to be convinced of this. You and I need to pray for discernment, to know the difference. Now, you say, Brother Mac, what are we supposed to do? We just become Mennonites and live up in Utah? No. No offense to Mennonites living in Utah. But you are to be in the world, but not what? Of the world. There's a big difference. Jesus was in the world, but he was not of the world. And so in that climax and in that time, in that moment, you and I must have a conscience that keeps us to know the difference. We live out our convictions and our conscience by being different. The Bible says we are a peculiar people. In other words, we're unusual. That's who we are. So I want you to notice what allowed David to do this. First of all, look at verse 12. May the Lord judge between you and me, and and may the Lord take vengeance on you for me, by, but my hand will never be against you. As the proverb says, wickedness comes from wicked people. My hand will never be against you. Who has the king of Israel come after? What are you chasing after? A dog? He's referring to himself. A flea? May the Lord be judge and decide between you and me. May he take notice and plead my case and deliver me from you. You see the contrast? King Saul was listening to the voices. King David did not. King Saul had no clear conviction of conscience. King David did. King Saul was after vengeance and taking things in and of himself. King David did not. And he literally bowed before the king and said, I could have killed you, but I, my security is not in my sword. My security is in the Lord God Almighty. What led him to do this incredible thing? Number one, he had faith in God to be the sovereign judge. God is the one who decides. God is the one who leads me. I didn't matter what happens to my life. God is the one who's in control. Actually, I think this is the crux of the matter. I mean, because after all, we are the ones that have given up our life for Christ already, right? We are the ones, according to Romans chapter 12, that, as Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice. What's a sacrifice? A sacrifice is something that's dead. But we're still living. Well, I'm to live as though I'm not. I don't live for the day. I live for eternity. That's our standard modem of operations. That's what we do. We are living. You know what a cross is, right? 
A cross is a symbol of execution. A cross is not jewelry, although I like cross jewelry. I don't have a problem with that. As long as it reminds you of what it really is. When Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me, what he meant was, go ahead and take the electric chair and carry it with you in case someone wants to execute you. It's a decision of death of the self. That when I come to Christ, I die to self and I live for him. I, I've made that decision. It's just I always need to be reminded of it. Unfortunately, we don't have the privilege of persecution to continue to remind us of that. We, we have the comfort of just cultural Christianity that keeps our conscience seared and defiled. And so those that are in persecution, when they attend church, like on a day like this, like in China, like brothers and sisters I talk to often, how's it going? Well, and the, a church of 200 is split into little bitty groups of just a few. And when they, if they go into groups of bigger, then they're basically putting a target on their back for the government to come and take them out. But if they meet in groups of few, then they can't sing too loud or someone will hear them. And so it's a constant reminder that we serve Jesus at our own peril. And that's why we wear a cross, to remind us that we could be put on the cross at any time. It's a statement of, I don't live for this life, I live for the next. In fact, I told you I had the conversation with one, and I said, how's the body of Christ in China dealing with all the persecution? His answer was, we're dealing with our persecution better than you're dealing with your comfort. Yeah, I said the same thing. I'm like, oh. So I guess it just believes if we I mean, I I guess it just comes down to this. Do we really believe that heaven is real and earth is fleeting? Do we really trust in a sovereign God that he's the judge and I'm not? So the first part of getting this victory is trusting and putting our faith in God who is judge. And secondly, the humility. God is the one who takes vengeance, not me. God is the one who grants justice. God is the one who gets rid of my loneliness. God is the one who gives me love. God is the one who takes care of my finances. And so I trust you. And then the third thing is patience. David just says, look, I don't care how long it takes. God said he was going to make me king. I'm not going to do it. He's going to have to do it. It's patience. He could have taken matters in his own hands, but instead he chose to wait and rest in the Lord God Almighty. Patience. This is where waiting on God becomes one of the greatest skills a Christian can have. It's a skill. You don't have what you think you ought to have, and you just begin to wait. God either changed my want to or my have to, or Lord, you bring it, and I'm content either way. Is that us today? I think we all have a long way to grow in this, but if you don't grow in this, you will fall in this. If you don't learn to trust the Lord in the midst of your insecurities, in the valleys of decisions, when you're back in a cave, you you will end up doing the wrong thing. And it's not good. Now's the time when you and I make the decision. Now's the time when we die to self, when we ask God to reboot our system and re-clear our conscience and allow us to work out a conviction that all that God says is true and that he chooses, he desires to bless you with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm. And we want God's kingdom to come on earth just as it is in heaven. And that's what we're praying for. And that's how God works in your life. Let's stand together and let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this incredible opportunity just to evaluate our trials and tribulations, to evaluate our blessings and our successes. And Lord, that we lay them at your feet right now. And Lord, we surrender to you all that we have, all of our ambitions, Lord, all of our fears, all of our regrets. And Lord, many of these are very, very painful. And we pray for your grace to come and to comfort us, for your grace is sufficient for every one of our needs. But Lord, we want you and nothing else. If you're here today and you don't know you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I want to invite you to know Him. He died on that cross for you to take away the dividing wall between you and Him, to take away the penalty of your sin, the offense of your sin. And by nailing it to the cross, it's an invitation for you to come right to the throne of God by trusting in Christ and His death, burial, and resurrection and reaching out to the Lord God Almighty. It's for you. It's for now. 
It's forever. Would you give him your life and trust him? Maybe there's something you want to turn over to the Lord and, or you want to recommit a vow, then the altar is open. Feel free to respond as we sing. Pastors will be here to pray with you if you'd like. Let's worship the Lord. Let's sing together. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. How great the pain of searing loss. The Father turns His face away as wounds which mark the chosen one. Many sons to Have a great week. You are dismissed. Go walk with the Lord.